Good morning and welcome to the class. I want us to begin. Today we are going to look at anatomy of the urinary system. You remember from our introductory lectures that uh, this is part of a big system that we call the urogenital system. So today we'll focus specifically on the urinary system. This is what you're going to learn in the first part of this lecture. It will have two parts. So you'll have this, then we'll give you a break, then we finish the second part. In the first part of the lecture, we're going to state the components of the urinary system these components can be viewed anatomically as well as functionally. We are also going to describe the anatomy of the kidney, both as seen outside and also as sectioned. We will explain the key functions of the kidney. We'll not belabor much on that because it's physiology will describe the structure of the nephron and will state the key functions of each part of the nephron. We will then explain the three basic renal processes. These processes are the mechanisms that underlie formation of urine. We'll explain the endocrine functions of the kidney and uh, we'll describe the anatomical components of the urinary passages. That is what you're going to do in this first part of the lecture. So let's start by looking at the first agenda there. The first agenda being the components of the urinary system. As I've already indicated, we can view the components of the urinary system from an anatomical point of view, as well as from a functional point of view. From an anatomical point of view, we just name the organs that constitute the urinary system. So from above downwards, we start from the kidneys, then the ureters, after that, the urinary bladder, and finally, the urethra. So those four organs are the anatomical components of the urinary system. From a physiological perspective, we look at the components of the urinary system based on the role of the various structures. On this account, we can look at the components of the urinary system in two categories. There are those components of the urinary system that are responsible for forming urine. We can call them the urine forming structures. Some accounts call them the excretory units or simply this is actually what we call the nephron. Then everything else that is not the nephron but is part of forming urine, it's part of uh, the functional system will belong to the path that is followed by urine. We call them the urine collecting structures. Understand therefore that the urine collecting structures simply refer to the urinary passages, the path, the path followed by urine. So if you understand this, then things like the urethra, urinary bladder, ureters, all those, are urine collecting structures. But urine collecting structures not limited to only those three. The kidney has both urine forming structures as well as urine collecting structures. And we'll be seeing shortly, what are the urine collecting structures that are within the kidney? So that's the first agenda to talk about the components of the urinary system. Our next agenda is then to describe the anatomy of the kidney. So the kidneys 
look like this. They are located within the lumbar regions. We talked about that some time back. And uh, they're usually behind the intestines. The structures which are behind the intestines in the abdomen are described as being retroperitoneal. They are behind the peritoneum lining. They are between the peritoneal lining and the posterior abdominal wall. So yes, they are within the abdomen, but behind the peritoneal lining. Both kidneys are retroperitoneal and indeed the urinary system is retroperitoneal. Each kidney has a superior pole there and inferior pole there. It is on the superior pole that the adrenal gland rests. Each kidney has anterior surface and posterior surface. The posterior surface of the kidneys are resting on the posterior abdominal wall. The anterior surface of the kidneys are related to various abdominal organs. And this would depend on whether it's the right kidney or the left kidney. For the right, for the left kidney, the one shown here, the anterior surface of the left kidney is related to a number of things. Around there, the adrenal gland. Around here, the fundus of the stomach around there, the spleen. In the middle here, the body of pancreas. Down here, the descending colon. And around there, the jejunum. So all those are organs which are related anteriorly to the left kidney. For the right kidney, the anterior surface of the right kidney is also related to a number of organs. So some of them would be the right suprarenal gland, the right lobe of the liver, the duodenum, the ascending colon, and the coils of the ileum. <clears throat> so those are anterior to the right kidney. The image here is for the left kidney. Each kidney also has borders. This is the lateral border. The lateral border is convex, as you can see there. And this is the medial border. The medial border of the kidney has this region that we call the renal hilum. So the renal hilum is where structures use to access the kidney. So therefore, there are some structures that go through the renal hilum. As you can see in this image, we have the renal artery, the renal vein, the ureta. We have fat as well. And what is not shown here are nerves. Those five elements go through the renal hilum. It is important to note that the kidneys are supplied with the renal vessels, as I've already partly indicated. So the renal artery is a branch of the descending outer. The vessel you're seeing there is the descending outer before it divides into the right and left common iliac arteries. So the descending abdominal outer is the one that gives you renal artery. This is the right renal artery, which goes to the right kidney. This is the left renal artery, which goes to the left kidney. The renal veins come from the kidneys and they join the inferior vena cava. So that is general for the external anatomy of the kidney. Now we can talk about the internal anatomy of the kidney. Internally, the kidney is covered by a connective tissue capsule. That connective tissue capsule is this one. 
we call it the renal capsule. It's a connective tissue covering of the kidney. This connective tissue covering the kidney protects the kidney, basically. Apart from the renal capsule, the internal part of the kidney has two other components. And one of those components, this region here, which we call the renal parenchyma. The renal parenchyma refers to the regions of the kidney that contain the nephron. That's the renal parenchyma. We are going to talk about the renal parenchyma shortly. But other than that, the third component of a section kidney will be this region here, which we call the pelvocalicial system. The pelvocalicial system refers to the urine collecting structures of the kidney. The structures that collect urine but are within the kidney, they constitute the pelvocalicial system. Again, we'll talk about the components shortly. Let's say something about the renal parenchyma. I have already indicated to you that the renal parenchyma represents this region here, the region that contain the nephron. Just to remind you that the nephron is just made up of tubules of epithelium. So it's predominantly epithelium. Therefore, the renal parenchyma is predominantly epithelial. We divide the renal parenchyma into two zones. The outer zone of the renal parenchyma is that one, which we call the renal cortex. This is the renal cortex. Outer zone of the renal parenchyma is known as the renal cortex. By definition, the renal cortex refers to the regions of the renal parenchyma that contain the renal corpuscles. You need to understand then what are renal corpuscles. If this image here shows you the nephron, this part of the nephron there is what we call the renal corpuscle. This part of the nephron is what you call the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle consists of two things. We have the Bowman's capsule and we have the glomerulus. So we are saying renal corpuscle is made up of Bowman's capsule and its glomerulus. And the regions where these corpuscles are found is what will be termed the renal cortex. In simple terms, the renal corpuscles are on the peripheral part of the renal parenchyma. So wherever the corpuscles are, that is renal cortex. Other than renal corpuscle, the other thing that is also found within the renal cortex are the convoluted tubules of the kidney. Both the proximal as well as the distal convoluted tubules of the nephron. They're also found within the renal cortex. Then we have the renal medulla. So by definition, the renal medulla would be the regions of the renal parenchyma that do not have the renal corpuscles. The regions of the renal parenchyma that lack the renal corpuscles are the ones we call the renal medulla. And this is the renal medulla. If you look at it, and especially the nephron, then we are appreciating the parts of the nephron that are within the renal medulla. And what I'm pointing at right now is the loop of Henle. And the other one is the collecting duct. So the loops of Henle as well as the collecting ducts are found within the renal medulla. On this image, we see something unique about the human kidney. 
the human kidney has a lot of things which look like this, conical in shape with an apex there and a base there. These are the what we call the renal pyramids. The renal pyramid are cortical structures within the renal medulla. The apex of the pyramid is on that side. The base of the pyramid is towards the cortex. The apex of the pyramid empty into what we call the minor calyx. So that apex of the pyramid contain openings of multiple collecting ducts, multiple collecting ducts empty at the minor calyx. That point where multiple collecting ducts open, which means the apex of the renal pyramid is what we call the renal papilla. So the renal papilla is the apex of the renal pyramid. It is where multiple collecting ducts open into the minor calyx. Other than the renal pyramids, we also have what we call the renal columns. The renal columns are regions of the, re of the medulla between the renal pyramids like the region I'm pointing right now, that's a renal column. Then there's a renal pyramid. That's another renal column. That's a renal pyramid. So the renal medulla contain the renal pyramids and the renal columns. Point to note is this, that we have about 10 to 12 pyramids in each kidney. Majority of people have that. However, their numbers can be as low as eight and as high as 18, but most people have about 10 to 12 renal pyramids. A renal pyramid and its surrounding cortical tissue constitute the renal lobe. A renal pyramid and its surrounding cortical tissue constitute what we call the renal lobe. So a renal lobe is made up of a renal pyramid and the surrounding cortical tissue. A renal lobe drains into a minor calyx. And so if you are saying that we have about 10 to 12 renal pyramids, it means we have about 10 to 12 renal lobes. And that means that uh, we have about 10 to 12 minor calyces. Okay, so that is the renal pyramid and this is the renal column, the region between the pyramids, or what we call the renal columns. They're all part of the renal medulla. I will define to you something else, the renal lobule a few minutes later. For now, you know what renal lobe is. We've not yet defined renal lobule. We'll define it later. Let's now say something about the pelvocalicial system. The pelvocalicial system refers to the urine collecting structures within the kidney. So they constitute the following. From each pyramid, we've said that the papilla, the papilla drains into minor calyx. So the minor calyces are part of the pelvocalicial system. Multiple minor calyces join to form a major calyx. So the major calyces are also part of the pelvocalicial system. We have a total of three major calyces, superior, middle, and inferior major calyx. Major calyces then open into the renal pelvis. There's only one renal pelvis. 
It is this renal pelvis that then continues as the ureter. But the ureter is not inside the pelvis, inside the kidney. Usually it's outside the kidney, it comes out from the renal pelvis. So pelvocalysis system consists of minor calyces, major calyces, and the renal pelvis. So that then summarizes that story of the anatomy of the kidney. We can now address that agenda, talk about the key functions of the kidney. And we can consider this as a key function of the kidney. The kidney is responsible for excretion of waste, excretion of substances. They could be metabolic wastes. They could be foreign substances like drugs that you've taken, toxins and the like. The kidney is also responsible for osmoregulation. This is what we others call electrolyte balance because you want to look at the volume of water and the amount of minerals within the blood that affect osmotic pressure. The minerals largely in question here would be sodium and potassium. The kidneys also are responsible for blood pressure regulation and uh, I may not be labor on that much because I believe you've done it adequately in physiology. But there are multiple mechanisms that the kidney would use to regulate your blood pressure. The kidney also regulate the amount of hydrogen ions in the circulation, amount of hydrogen ions in the blood and that affects the acidity and alkalinity of blood. Lastly, the kidney participate in the pathway of multiple hormones and we'll be elaborating on that as a distinct uh, specific objective in this lecture. So you can put a comma there as with regard to the fifth function of the kidney. I consider this major function of the kidney, you in your physiology, you may have give, been given a longer list than that, than this one, and that is still okay. What you're told is still true. I've just captured the key ones, or which I think I wanted to highlight on. Now let's talk about the structure of the nephron. We will look at the structure of the nephron and we'll also state the functions of each part of the nephron. Um, you need to understand that the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. The nephron is a functional unit of the kidney. Okay, so at this point then we engage actively in a conversation. So I don't know, Tabi, have you people been taught the physiology of the kidney, urinary system? Tabby, yes. you, you've yes. done physiology of the urinary system? Yes. Okay, fair enough. So that will make my work a bit easier. Thank you. Okay, so on that note, therefore, let me start with the Adelida. Adelida, you're in? Yes. Okay, Adelida, what do you call that part of the nephron, the one drawn there? Oh. I, can't, I can't recall. Okay, we call it the Bowman's capsule. So this is called the Bowman's capsule. Okay. The Bowman's capsule has two layers. The inner layer is called the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. And the outer layer is called the parietal layer of the Bowman's capsule. The space between the two layers is what you call the Bowman's space. Geraldine, you're in? Yes. 
Okay, Geraldine, there's a tuft of blood vessels that is found within the Bowman's capsule. What do you call it? Um, is it the glomerulus? Yes, so that's the glomerulus. So the glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries that is found within the 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 glomerulus sorry found within the bowman's capsule that's the glomerular tuft of capillaries now there's a blood vessel that takes blood to the glomerulus and that's what we call the afferent arterial and there is another vessel that takes blood away from the glomerulus and that's what we call the efferent arterial so this structure here made up of the Bowman's capsule and its glomerulus is what you are calling the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle has two sides or two poles. This pole here is called the vascular pole. This is where the blood vessels enter and leave. We call the vascular pole. And this pole here is called the urinary pole. This is where urine come out from, or at least the filtered come out from. Asma, are you in? Yes. Okay, Asma, what is the key role of the renal corpuscle? Asma, it's not fair to keep quiet if I've asked you a question. If you don't know, you just say you don't know. I don't know. That's much better. So the key role of the renal corpuscle is alter filtration of urine. The renal corpuscle is a site of urine alter filtration. And alter filtration of urine occurs under pressure. We'll be saying something about that shortly. For that reason, the renal corpuscle has anatomical adaptations that enable it to perform that role. Arising from the renal corpuscle is this region here, which looks like that. And uh, Florence is going to give us the name of that region. Florence, what do you call that part of the nephron? Um, the loop, loop of Henle. This will not. This will not be the loop of Henle, because it's not looping. We call it the proximal convoluted tubule, the PCT. So this is the proximal convoluted tubule. From the renal corpuscle, we have the proximal convoluted tubule. Occasionally, we ask you to use a diagram to illustrate the parts of the nephron. And I want you to demonstrate that the convoluted tubule is actually convoluted. You know, convoluted means it, it has some bends. It has some turns, the convolutions. So I want that to come out if I ask you to illustrate the parts of the nephron. So the proximal convoluted tubule is made up of simple columnar epithelium with several microvilli. It is also convoluted as you can see. Okay, Fred, you're in? Yes. Okay, Fred, what's the key role of the PCT? The absorption of substances that are useful in the body. Great. So the site of tubular reabsorption. It is for that reason, therefore, that the proximal convoluted tubule has several microvilli because the site of tubular reabsorption. 
remember tubular reabsorption. Okay, from the PCT, we have this part that goes down like that. And that's what we call the loop of angle. Jane, you're in? Yes. Okay, Jane, what do you call this segment of the loop of handle? Descending loop of handle. Okay, Jane, still with you. So what's the difference between this one and that one? The cursor is not moving, I can't see well. Okay, has it moved now? No. And now? Yes. Okay, so what do you call that part of the descending loop of handle? Um, I don't remember. Okay, fair enough. So we have the loop of handle. The whole thing is called the loop of handle. The loop of handle has thick and thin segments it also has descending and ascending segments. So we call the first one there, the thick descending limb of the loop of handle. We call the second one there, the thin descending limb of the loop of handle. We call this part the loop. We call this one, the thin ascending limb of the loop of handle. And we call this one the thick ascending limb of the loop of handle. So the loop of handle has those four key segments. Generally, the thick descending limb and the thick ascending limb of the loop of handle are the ones that are sometimes referred to as the straight tubules. This is to distinguish them from their associated convoluted tubules. The thick, the straight tubules tend to have similar structure like the adjacent convoluted tubule, albeit the fact that they are straight now, not convoluted, which means they are simple column now, simple cuboidal. But the thin segment of the loop of N are lined by simple square mass epithelium. Jim, tie you in. Jim, tie. Yes. Okay, Jim, tie. What's the key role of the loop of N? Reabsorption of water and sodium ions. Okay, why would the loop of handle reabsorb those things? What's the overall role? What's the overall purpose? <sighs> to regulate blood pressure. Okay, it could be that that becomes a secondary thing though. So the key role of um, the loop of handle is urine concentration. The key role is to concentrate urine. And on that note, therefore, in your physiology, you may have been told about mechanisms that the loop of handle uses to concentrate urine. There's some things we call the countercurrent exchanger there's some things we call the countercurrent multiplier. The loop and the medal of the kidney uses those two key mechanisms to concentrate urine. Kenya, you're in? Yes. Okay, Kenya, what's the what's the purpose of urine concentration? Why should the loop of fennel concentrate urine? And indeed, why should the kidney concentrate urine? Why not just pour it out? It has to be concentrated before it comes out. Yeah. 
Any idea, Kenya? Kenya, I think it's respect I think, to talk. Mm -hmm. I think it's for the uh, for the purpose of the the better functioning of the kidney. What do you mean? If if it wasn't concentrated, the kidney will not function well. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that may not be accurate. The reason why the kidney concentrate urine is because urine concentration is a mechanism of water conservation. That's the mechanism that the kidney uses to conserve body water, which is one of the functions of the kidney anyway. And secondarily, that would affect uh, uh, blood pressure, as the previous speaker said. Okay, from the loop of Henle, then urine moves to a region that looks like that. And uh, this is what we call the distal convoluted tubule. To distinguish it from the proximal convoluted tubule. So this is the distal convoluted tubule. One thing I want you to note is that the distal convoluted tubule is located next to the renal corpuscle. So if you're asked to draw, you don't draw this thing far away from this one, that would be wrong. It is located next to the renal corpuscle. And indeed it is located adjacent to the afferent arterial. Again, point to note. Mariam, you in? Yes. Yeah, okay, Mariam, what's the key role of the DCT? Um, I think it's to, it functions in the absorption of water and mineral ions. Okay, fair enough. But if I was to be asked to state two key functions of the DCT, I'll give you the following. Um, one of the key functions of the DCT is that it is a chemoreceptor zone. It detects the concentration of sodium in urine. So it's a chemoreceptor zone. For that reason, there are some specialist cells within the DCT, which we call the macular denser cells. These are the cells that de detect the concentration of sodium in urine. There's a reason why they do that, and I'll be explaining that shortly when you talk about what we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Apart from the DCT being a chemoreceptor zone because of the presence of the macular denser cells, the DCT is also a site of hormonally regulated sodium reabsorption. It is the site of hormonally regulated sodium reabsorption. That's just to clarify on what Mariam has just said, that's a site of mineral reabsorption. The mineral, the primary mineral we are talking about here is sodium. And for the DCT to absorb sodium, to reabsorb sodium, it needs the presence of a hormone. It's the site of hormonally regulated sodium reabsorption. Masi, are you in? Masi? Me. Okay, Masi. Uh, which hormone are we referring to here? Sorry? Antidiuretic hormone. Well, it will not be antidiuretic hormone it will be aldosterone. So the DCT is a site of aldosterone regulated sodium reabsorption. It's a site where sodium is reabsorbed in the presence of aldosterone hormone. So if I was to be asked the two key functions of the DCT, I'll say those ones. 
but I can still add others. Now, when aldosterone is promoting reabsorption of sodium, it will do that also, uh, it will do that in exchange with potassium ions. So as we take sodium from the urine to the bloodstream, it is one positive charge back to the bloodstream. We replace that with one positive charge from the bloodstream to the urine. And that one positive charge is of potassium ion. So sodium is reabsorbed, yes, in exchange with potassium, which is lost. And the term given for losing things from the bloodstream to renal tubules is tubular secretion. So if I was to be asked to state the third key function of the DCT, I'll say the site of hormonally regulated potassium secretion. Apart from that, it was a site of secretion of hydrogen ions as well. Right, so those are the key functions of the DCT. Um, as urine goes from the DCT, it enters a region which will look like, look like this. So there's that one there. And there's this segment here. Fares, you're in with us. Yes. Fares, what do you call the part I'm pointing right now? The collecting duct. Okay, so that will not be the collecting duct. That will be the collecting tubule. Then this big one is the collecting duct. So we have the collecting tubule and the collecting duct. The primary role of the collecting tubule and the collecting duct, of course, is to collect urine, as the name suggests. And indeed, one collecting duct receives from multiple collecting tubules, which means from multiple nephrons. One collecting duct and all the nephrons it is draining constitute the renal lobule. I promise that I will define for you what the renal lobule is. A renal lobule refers to one collecting duct and all the nephrons it is draining. That's a lobule. Different from a lobe, which is one pyramid and the surrounding cortical tissue. Okay. So we've said that the collecting tubules and the collecting ducts basically collect urine. The collecting ducts are the ones which are going to then empty at the renal papilla into the minor calyx. Apart from collecting urine, okay, so this one goes to Rosmarion. Rosmarion, apart from collecting urine, what's the other role of the collecting tubules and collecting duct? <clears throat> Can you say concentrating the urine? Great, it's for urine concentration. That is still true as well. The site of urine concentration and we concentrate urine by reabsorbing water. So the collecting ducts concentrate urine by water reabsorption. The water reabsorption that occurs at the collecting duct is also hormonally regulated. So it's a site of hormonally regulated urine concentration or hormonally regulated water reabsorption. Roilin, you're in. Roilin? Yes, yes. Okay, which hormone are we referring to here? Pardon, please. Which hormone are we referring to in this context? Mm -hmm. The one that <laughs> Aldosterone. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, I don't think you're following us. We've already mentioned aldosterone roiling. So the hormone you are referring to here is antidiuretic hormone. Okay. Vasopressin is the hormone you are referring to here. So collecting tubules and collecting ducts are a site of hormonally regulated water reabsorption, the site of vasopressin regulated water reabsorption. Right, so that is the structure of the nephron. And I've taken you through slowly the key functions of each part of the nephron as well, so that you know the role of each part of the nephron. Okay, now we can talk about the types of nephrons. There are two types of nephrons. There are those nephrons which are really very short. We call them cortical nephrons. These cortical nephrons are predominantly in the renal cortex. They are very short loops and they are predominantly within the renal cortex. So this is a cortical nephron. They have short loops and they're predominantly within the renal cortex. The primary role of the cortical nephrons is um, <clears throat> excretion of substances. Different from what you call the juxtaglomerular nephrons. Even though the renal corpuscle of a juxtaglomerular nephron is still found in the cortex by definition, most of the other parts of that nephron is found within the renal medulla. And importantly also, the loop is very long. They are very long loops of hen and predominantly in the medulla. Such nephrons are the ones responsible for urine concentration. They're the ones that are in the mechanisms of urine concentration. I'll not go through the mechanisms of urine concentration because that's largely physiology. Okay, we can talk about blood flow to the nephron, blood supply to the nephron. So the blood vessel that enters the nephron, that enters the glomerulus is what we call the afferent arterial. It's an arterial basically, arterials divide to capillaries. The glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries. From that capillary, routinely, we expect that after you've come from capillaries, you go to venules, then veins, then the heart. But in this case, that is not the case. That's not the situation here. From the tuft of capillaries in the glomerulus, we form an arterial again. We call that the efferent arterial. From the efferent arterial, you have another capillary network. But there are two types of capillary networks. There's a capillary network that we call the peritubular capillaries. The peritubular capillaries refer to the capillary network around the convoluted tubules, both the proximal as well as the distal convoluted tubules. That is what we call the peritubular capillaries, the capillaries around the convoluted tubules. The other capillary network is the one that follow the loop of Henle. And that capillary network around the loop of Henle is what we call the vasa recta. So they are both capillaries, the vasa recta aid in the mechanisms of urine concentration. As you can see, 
the direction of blood flow in the vasa recta is in the opposite direction as urine flow in the loop of Henle. That is part of what we call the countercurrent mechanism. That helps in urine concentration in mechanisms that uh, may have already been explained to you in your physiology lecture. So from those capillaries, then we have veins going, venules and veins going back. That's how the nephron receive blood supply. We can now highlight on the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidney. The juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidney are located where the distal convoluted tubule makes contact with the afferent arterial. I told you that if you're asked to draw, then you need to illustrate it in such a manner that the DCT makes contact with the afferent arterial. So at that point where the DCT makes contact with the afferent arterial, there are some cells which are present there, which constitute part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. One of them are the macular denser cells. Macular denser cells are specialized epithelial cells of the distal convoluted tubule. They are epithelial cells of the distal convoluted tubule. These specialized epithelial cells of the DCT are the ones that detect the concentration of sodium in urine. In response to that, let's say the concentration of sodium in urine is low, then macular denser cells secrete some paracrine substances. You now know what paracrine means. It secretes some paracrine substances that act on the second cellular component of this entity, and that is the juxtaglomerular cells. So what are they? The juxtaglomerular cells are smooth muscle cells. They're found within the tunica media of the afferent arterial. They are specialized smooth muscle cells in the tunica media of the afferent arterial. In response to the paracrine signals from the macular denser cells, the juxtaglomerular cells secrete renin. Renin is part of this big system we are calling renin angiotensin aldosterone system that is responsible for regulation of blood pressure. So that is juxtaglomerular apparatus. They are responsible for regulation blood pressure through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. All right. I now want to then talk about <clears throat> the three basic renal processes. These are the mechanisms that underlie formation of urine. So maybe before that, I ask one of you. So now Tabi with you. Tabi, name for us the three renal processes. Tabi, you're in? Tabi? Yes, I'm in. Okay, what are the three basic renal processes? Yes, I'm in. Um, I would say <clears throat> reabsorption, mm -hmm. um, filtration, and and secretion. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> so there are three basic renal processes, and these are the mechanisms of urine formation. One of them is called glomerular filtration. The second one is called tubular reabsorption. 
And the third one is called tubular secretion. I hope you are taught three in physiology, but in case they taught four, then the fourth one would be urine formation. But usually we talk of three. Okay, let's start with the glomerular filtration. So glomerular filtration is the seepage of plasma from the glomerular tuft to the Bowman space. The seepage of plasma from the glomerular tuft to the Bowman space requires some pressure difference. There must be higher pressure within the glomerular capillaries to drive the plasma to the Bowman space. There must be some pressure gradient. And that is why if someone's blood pressure goes down, then glomerular filtration cannot take place. We call that acute renal failure or renal shutdown. The kidneys cannot excrete, cannot, glomerular filtration cannot occur, so the kidneys cannot excrete anything if blood pressure goes down. Well, you may have been taught in your physiology that either way, the kidney has what we call autoregulation. It is able to regulate glomerular filtration within some physiological blood pressure range. So the blood pressure must be really low, maybe be below 70, below 90 mean arterial pressure, or below 70 mean arterial pressure for you to affect glomerular filtration. And it has to be as high as maybe 180 and above to again affect glomerular filtration. Otherwise, if within normal blood pressure or slightly hypertensive, the glomerular filtration is still within normal range. Now, how does the filtration take place? Glomerular filtration occurs through what you call the fenestra. What are fenestra? In our earlier discussion on the cardiovascular system, we talked about types of capillaries. We mentioned fenestrated capillaries, continuous capillaries, and sinusoidal capillaries, which we also call the discontinuous capillaries. The fenestrated type of capillaries are capillaries that have holes through their endothelial cells. So what happened? If these capillaries have holes through their wall, it means that when blood comes through, blood can seep through those holes. Those holes are the ones we are calling fenestra. So in this image here, these are the endothelial cells and those small dots are the holes through which filtrate can pass. Those are the fenestra. But that's not all. On the other hand, the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule has some cells that engulf or surround the glomerulus. So they surround the glomerulus, but how do they look like? They look like this green thing you're seeing here. Those specialized cells are called podocytes. Remember, they're on the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. They surround the glomerulus. So you can imagine a fenestrated capillary being surrounded by a cell that has finger-like projections which look like this. What that means is that there's some gaps between these finger-like projections that filtered can pass through. Those gaps are known as filtration slits. So the filtrate, after passing through the fenestra, will also percolate through the filtration slits of the podocytes. And that's what enables filtration to pass through. However, remember, the endothelial cells are epithelial cells. So they have basement membrane. 
The podocytes are also epithelial cells. So they also have basement membrane. The two basement membranes are fused together. And so that basement membrane forms the actual anatomical barrier to glomerular filtration. Look at this cross section here. Let's assume this is the lumen of a blood vessel, the lumen of a capillary, the lumen of one of the capillaries of the glomerulus. That green one shows you an endothelial cell with holes through it, the fenestra. Pressure within here will make plasma to go through the fenestra. But this green cell, the endothelium, is an epithelial cell, so it has its basement membrane, that one. On the other hand, we have a podocyte, which gives you finger-like projections around the glomerulus. So with multiple finger-like projections, it means that there'll be gaps between the fingers, the filtration slits. So the podocyte also being epithelial, it will also have basement membrane there. So this shows you a fused basement membrane of the podocytes together with the endothelial cell. But the filter will pass through the fenestra, then the basement membrane, then the filtration slits into the pulmonary space. Only the smaller substances can be allowed. That's the plasma. The large substances like cells of the blood cannot be allowed unless there's something that has destroyed the glomerular filtration barrier. So the glomerular filtration barrier is formed by the basement membrane. This is the one that forms the actual anatomical barrier, but even these ones are also, can be considered as barriers, except when you look at it carefully, they are not really forming the actual barrier. There is danger of this region to be clogged with uh, a lot of filtered substances can easily block this region. And for that reason, there's some specialized cells in the kidney that continuously clean the glomerular filtration barrier. Those cells are called the mesangial cells. Okay, so that is glomerular filtration. I think in physiology, you must have been told that uh, we filter a lot of urine per day about 180 liters of urine is filtered per day. But you don't produce all that amount of urine because 99% of the water is reabsorbed. Tubular reabsorption. Let's talk about it. So tubular reabsorption is the uptake of substances from the filtered, whatever is within the renal tubules whatever has been filtered through the glomerular filtration is what I'm calling the filtered. You see, when blood comes like this, then afferent arterial, glomerular taft, efferent arterial, this blood that enters through the glomerulus that becomes filtered here, we are filtering plasma. You know, you filter good and bad substances, all of them, because we are not really selecting so much there. Maybe just selecting based on charges and size, not based on whether good or bad. So things become filtered here, water, glucose, sodium and the like. Some of those substances, you actually do need them. So the ones that you need, what do you do to them? You take them back from the renal tubules back to the peritubular capillaries. So the uptake of useful substances from the filtered, which is in the renal tubules, back to the peritubular capillaries is what you call tubular reabsorption. This process of tubular reabsorption occurs in many parts of the nephron, but most of it actually occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. And that's why as an adaptation, the PCT has a lot of microvilli to increase the surface area for tubular reabsorption. The third event is the tubular secretion. Now look, if blood is coming like this, 
then enter through the glomerulus, filtration occurs. Some blood will definitely still go here. The blood that's going here is not necessarily containing good things. There's some things within here that you don't like. So due to them, the substance that you don't like that are still here can still be released into the bloodstream. So it can still be released into the renal tubules. So it's the further release of unwanted substances from the peritubular capillaries into the bloodstream. Sorry, what did I say? It is the further release of unwanted substances from the peritubular capillaries into the renal tubules. So it joined the filtrate. You are taking substances from the bloodstream. These substances were not filtered, but you still don't want them. So you're taking from the bloodstream into the renal tubules to join the filtrate. That is what you call tubular secretion. Again, this occurs in many parts of the nephron, but most of it would then happen in the loop of Henle as well as in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, now that brings me to then to the endocrine functions of the kidneys. Before I take you through the endocrine functions of the kidneys, I want you to answer this question. You will answer it in the chat. And I want you to just say A, B, C, D, or E. Your responses can only be seen by me, nobody else. Okay, you have one minute for this. Carry on, after the one minute, you'll not be able to respond. So most of you have said A, but that is wrong. Anyone to tell me why A could be wrong? Anyone? Okay, nobody, you'll still tell me one day, don't worry. We'll proceed. <clears throat> so. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, for me, I think it's right because when you're teaching us about it, you said it's from the kidney, the renin. Okay. That is true. Okay. We have it in, in, in physiology. <clears throat> um, that question, I agree that renin comes from the kidney. That one I've not denied. I'm just saying this in this question, renin is a wrong choice. Roelin, you brought it up. What is renin? I know renin from the RAS system. Yeah, what is the it? It's the one that uh, will be produced to activate the angiotensin, yeah. Yeah, so you're telling me what it does, but I'm asking you, what is it? Um, well, it's not a hormone, yeah. It's I really don't know, <clears throat> but I've realized it's not a hormone. It is not a hormone, and that's why it's wrong, okay? Great. Okay, so let's look at the endocrine functions of the kidney. So one, the kidney produces erythropoietin. It's a hormone. Erythropoietin is secreted by both the kidney as well as the liver, usually in response to low oxygen tension. Uh, the liver is the one that produces erythropoietin largely in the fetus as well as uh, in the perinatal period, but in you and me, the kidney is the one that largely produces erythropoietin. Okay, so this question goes to Tony Timayo. You're in? 
Yes, yes, I'm in. Okay, Tony, what's the target of erythropoietin? Where does erythropoietin act? I'm not sure, but from what I know is uh, it increases the erythrocytes production, but I don't know exactly where. Okay, fair enough. You're thinking on the right track, Tony. So if it increases erythrocyte production, where are the erythrocytes produced? Tony. I'm not sure. Hey, Tony, you don't know where red blood cells are produced? The liver. Hey. So blood cells are produced in the bone marrow. So the target of erythropoietin is bone marrow. And the physiological effect is to stimulate red blood cell production. And that's why if a patient has chronic renal failure, they may also get anemia. We call it anemia of chronic renal failure. All right. The second hormonal role of the kidney is with regard to vitamin D. We talked about this some time back. We said that vitamin D has two sources. The precursors of vitamin D can either come from the skin or from what we eat. Either way, it will be in the inactive form of vitamin D. This inactive form of vitamin D is processed through the liver into another inactive form, an intermediate metabolite of vitamin D. We call it calcidiol. Then calcidiol is then processed now through the kidney into the active form of vitamin D, what we call calcitriol. Well, there'll be other inactive metabolites as well, but that's not important. So vitamin D acts on the intestines, one of the target organ, to promote the absorption of calcium. It also acts on bone tissue to promote bone resorption, which means that bone releases calcium into the bloodstream. You see, for the first one, calcium enters the bloodstream. For the second one, calcium enters the bloodstream. It also acts on the kidney to reduce the loss of calcium in urine. So if that happens, therefore, again, you increase the concentration of calcium in blood. So in overall, vitamin D increases the levels of calcium in blood through those three mechanisms. The third hormonal role of the kidney is in, as you've already indicated, in this pathway of renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So in this system, we say that there's what we call angiotensinogen. Um, Adelida. Adelida? Yes. What is angiotensinogen and where does it come from? Um, but so is it, it's a hormone. Okay, so angiotensinogen is a protein and this protein is produced by the liver. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, is it a hormone? It's a hormone. Now I'm the one who muted you because you're taking too long. Uh, 
So angiotensinogen is a protein produced by the liver. So angiotensinogen produces the liver, sorry, <clears throat> the liver produces angiotensinogen and releases it into the circulation. In the circulation, angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1. The conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 requires renin, which is an enzyme. We have indicated that this renin enzyme is produced by the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney. Geraldine, you're in. Yes. What factors stimulate the juxtaglomerular cells to secrete renin? Sorry. Factors that stimulate <coughs> juxtaglomerular cells to secrete renin. What factors promote renin secretion? When is it when the blood blood pressure is low? Okay, that's one. Good. Another one. Uh, I only know that. that okay, right. Fair enough. There are three factors that may stimulate um, juxtaglomerular cells to secrete training. One of them is a fall in blood pressure, as Geraldine has indicated. But remember, I'd already told you that if sodium levels are also low, the ones being delivered in the DCT, then the macular denser cells will sense that and cause secretion of renin. So that's another one. And the third one is if you have an increase in the sympathetic activity. So those are the stimulants for renin secretion. Once renin has been secreted into the bloodstream, it will help in the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. This conversion does not necessarily occur in the kidney. It can occur in the circulation. Now in the circulation, we have angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 become converted to angiotensin 2. This conversion from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 is promoted by an enzyme we are calling angiotensin converting enzyme. The angiotensin converting enzyme is produced by <clears throat> the endothelial cells of the lung capillaries. So basically it produced by the lungs. This angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin one to angiotensin two. So this angiotensin two is the active form of hormone that we want to talk about. Angiotensin two has multiple target organs. It acts on blood vessels. It acts on the pituitary gland. It acts in the adrenal cortex and it acts on the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. Okay, Asma, you're in. Yes. Okay, Asma, what's the effect of angiotensin 2 on blood vessels? Okay. Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction. It makes the blood vessels to vasoconstrict. It also has an effect on the adrenal cortex and it causes secretion of aldosterone hormone. Florence, you're in? Yes, I'm in. Okay, Florence, which zone of the adrenal cortex will be the target of angiotensin 2? Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. So it acts on the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex. 
That's the one that secretes mineral corticoids. Then aldosterone hormone, which is a mineral corticoid, act on the DCT to increase the reabsorption of sodium. And if that happens, water also follows sodium. Angiotensin II also has an effect on the pituitary gland. It causes secretion of vasopressin. Fred, you're in? Yes. On which lobe of the pituitary gland will angiotensin II act? I don't know. Which lobe of the pituitary gland produces antidiuretic anti hormone, Fred? Anterior. Sorry? Posterior. Posterior. Posterior pituitary. So it acts on the posterior pituitary gland to promote um, secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Jane, you're in? Yes. Okay, Jane, what are the target organs of vasopressin? Renal tubules and blood vessels. Great. So it acts on blood vessels to cause vasoconstriction and it acts on the renal tubule, specifically the collecting ducts to cause the reabsorption of water. Angiotensin II also acts on the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidney. And the effect is to promote the reabsorption of sodium as well as that of water. So if this happen, vasoconstriction means that uh, you increase peripheral resistance, the total peripheral resistance. And if you reabsorb water and sodium, it means that we expand the blood volume. If we do expand blood volume, and we also increase total peripheral resistance. We basically raise the mean arterial pressure. And that's why renin angiotensin aldosterone system elevates the blood pressure. Okay, let's do the last part of this lecture. So the last part is to talk about anatomical components of the urinary passages. So from the nephron, we have collecting ducts. Collecting ducts empty into minor calyces. Minor calyces empty into major calyces. Major calyces empty into the renal pelvis. From the renal pelvis, urine goes to the ureter. From the ureter, urine goes to the urinary bladder and then to the urethra. And so those are the components of the urinary passages. Let's say something about the, okay, let's say something about the ureter first, then something about the urinary bladder. So the ureter is just a muscular tube that connects the kidney to the urinary bladder. There's a segment of the ureter in the abdomen, so you call it abdominal ureter. And there's a segment of the ureter in the pelvis, you call it pelvic ureter. The ureter has three points of narrowing, three points of anatomical constriction. The first one is here. The junction between the renal pelvis and the ureter, we call that ureteropelvic junction, UPJ. A second one is here. At the junction between the abdominal and the pelvic ureter, we call that the pelvic brim. So it is constricted at the pelvic brim as well. And lastly, the junction between the ureter and the urinary bladder, we call that the ureterovesical junction. So ureteropelvic junction, pelvic brim, and ureterovesical junction. Those are points of ureteric constriction. Okay, we can now talk about the urinary bladder. 
Give me a second, I connect the power. All right, we are good. So the urinary bladder is a muscular sac that stores urine basically. It is located in the pelvis, but if it is full, it will extend to the abdomen, specifically in the suprapubic region. <clears throat> the muscle wall, the muscle of the urinary bladder is what we call the detrusa muscle. Within the bladder, we have three openings, two for the ureter, for the ureters and one for the urethra. This region surrounded by the three openings is what we call the bladder trigon. At the sphinct, at the blood, at the urinary blood, at the urethra there, we have a sphincter. Sphincter that controls urine output. We call the urethral sphincter. So this is how it will be like in male, the urethra will have to go through the prostate gland. And this is how it will be like in female, there's no prostate gland, of course. Okay, now we talk about the urethra. So this is the urethra in female, and this is the urethra in males. There are some differences we can pick between the urethra in females and the urethra in males. <clears throat> One of the differences in the length, the urethra in males is longer than the urethra in females. Another difference in the diameter, the urethra in females is wider than the urethra in males. So that will then advice on the type of catheters that you can use to catheterize these two gender. The other difference in the orientation, we can say that the male urethra is angulated and the urethra in females is relatively straight. Now this angulation is irrespective of whether the penis is erect or it is flaccid, the urethra is still angulated. The site of opening of the two also vary. The male urethra opens externally at the tip of the penis. The urethra in females is difficult to see unless you really peep it internally. And in terms of functions, the female urethra has only one function, urinary function, while the male urethra has both urinary as well as reproductive functions. Let me take you back to that image. <clears throat> so this is the male urethra, very long compared to the female urethra, which is shorter. Again, female urethra is wider than male urethra. Female urethra is more straight as you can see the male urethra is angulated. This is the angulation at that point. You know, this one does not matter whether the penis is erect or not. That angle is still there, so it's angulated. Male urethra opens there externally. Female urethra, usually you need to have to peep because this labia majora there, it hides it. Now, as we discuss the urethra, maybe I need to tell you that the male urethra has three segments. There's a part of the urethra that is passing from urinary bladder through the prostate there, we call that the prostatic urethra. The prostatic urethra is the part of the male urethra that goes through prostate. It is the widest part of the male urethra, but it's also the part that is most commonly constricted because of prostate hypertrophy. So it's the one that's most commonly blocked. After prostatic urethra, we go to this region here, which we call the membranous urethra. It is the shortest and narrowest part of the male urethra. 
the membranous urethra is the part of the urethra that traverses the pelvic floor. So that is the membranous urethra. Then we have this other part here, which we call the penile urethra. The penile urethra is the part of the urethra that goes through the penis. That's the penile urethra. The part of the urethra that traverses the penis. The penile urethra is the longest part of the ure male urethra. Some people talk about the penile urethra as having two parts. This part of the penile urethra is called the spongy urethra. And this part of the male urethra is called, <clears throat> sorry, this part, the distal part is the one we call the spongy urethra. And this other part is called the bulbar urethra. The bulbar urethra and the spongy urethra. Spongy because it's located within what you call corpus spongiosum of the penis. Bulbar because it's located in what we call the bulb of the penis. We'll talk about the sponge of the penis and the bulb of the penis in our next lecture when you look at the male reproductive system. So that is it for the urethra. And I think that summarizes Therefore, what I had for you in that first part, in the interest of time, I think I'll just stop there. Um, I promise to take you up to noon and it's noon, a few minutes to noon. So I'll not start the next part of the lecture, which was on embryonic origins and congenital malformations of the urinary system. We'll stop there for today. Um, so we'll pick from this next time. I'll invite you for questions if you do have.